Father God, we see the fire that is protecting us, Father God. A fire, Father God, by night and a cloud by day, Father God. Lord, Father God, we drink from that spiritual drink from that rock, whom is Jesus Christ. Father God, we come before you, Lord, thanking you for the opportunity to be in the house of worship, Lord. With so many blessings, Lord God, so many wonderful things, Lord God. Sound floors, stages, equipment, buildings, fans, air conditioning, heat in the wintertime. We're so blessed. There are countries that that are on, in bamboo shacks, that are underground, that are on dirt floors, and yet without sound equipment. And yet I met their worship and their prayers are beautiful in the world. 
consists of, I mean, we're blessed. Look, look, you know, it might not, not be the fanciest building, but it's our building. It's God's worship house. It has everything we need. And plus, shouldn't we be grateful in all things? to get over ourselves, Lord. Starting with me, Lord. I keep seeking your face and I keep weeping before you because, Lord, you're knocking on the door of our hearts, Lord. You're saying, hey, it's me. It's me whom you say you worship. I want to show you how to worship me in spirit and truth. I want to draw you to me like you've never been drawn before, breaking all the barriers, all the old, stuck, pit mentalities that we have, that we've carried over from our old natures into the kingdom of God. God says, I'm going to shake that out. Don't you understand? I'm going to shake it out because the kingdom that I present, the kingdom that you're in, has no room for that stuff. Give us this new life, Lord. You've opened up the door for us through the blood. I'm so blessed. I'm so blessed. I got all of you to love and serve and share the word of God with. I got a wonderful help me that's prayer partner with me. And I'm at the age now where I'm just half full. And I'm ready to overflow. I don't want to get up to the top. I want to overflow in the presence of God. But I don't want to be by myself. But if I have to be, I will be. I want everybody to get excited because you ain't seen nothing yet. <laughs> the new song, brother, that you wrote, that God gave you.
Praise Him for His mighty acts. Praise Him according to His excellent, excellent greatness. Praise Him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise Him with the psaltery and the harp. Praise Him with the timbrel and the dance. Praise Him with string instruments and organs. Praise Him upon the loud cymbals. Praise Him upon the high sounding cymbals. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Praise be the Lord. Amen. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. Praise God. You may be seated, brothers and sisters. Let me ask you something. Are you blessed to be here tonight? Blessed to be here. Well, I'm blessed to be here too. So I can praise my God with his people. So that we can sing praises unto the Lord. So that we can get outside of ourselves and touch one another in faith for a greater purpose. For a greater meaning. So that we can praise God who is our salvation. So we can praise God who is our strength. Oh God, let the words of our mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable unto you. And Lord, I know that the only way that happens is when our praise and all that concerns us is about you and not ourselves. So Lord God, help us with that. How about you, Sister Adrian? Are you blessed to be here tonight? I'm blessed to be here. How about you, Brother Clyde? What do you have to share with the congregation? I am so blessed to be here. Hallelujah. How about you, Sister Brooklyn? I'm blessed to be here. God's opening up some doors for you, right? Amen. Are you excited? Oh, praise the Lord. How about you, Sister Love? I'm blessed to be here. And my dear brother, worship leader. Also blessed to be here. Hallelujah. Let me hear it one more time. Are you really blessed to be here? Blessed to be here. All right. Let's give God all the glory. Sound you may be seated. Well, I want you to play a few measures of our great thou art. Congregation, I want you to sing a few measures with us. Because you see, it's about how great he is to you. Not to me. See Lydia back there is looking at everybody that's passing by. Let's teach and help give that child an example of how to be worshipers in spirit and truth. Let's help the parents. Let's help one another. Be more than we were yesterday. Let the words of our mouth when we speak to one another be edifying. How oh, oh, is my God? You sing with me now. Oh, you sing with me. It's my God. I will pray. Oh, you sing now. Oh, how great. Oh, how great. Oh, Father, that help us. Draw us into that place, Father God. Oh, how great. It's my God. You sing with me now. Oh, you sing with me. It's my God. I will oh, see how oh, great it is my God. Oh, Father God, we're here today just worshiping and praising you, Lord God. There's so much, Father God, that is going on in our everyday lives. But, Father God, you say that, Lord, when we were with you, you were with us, Lord. I pray, Father God, that you help us, Father God, serve you with gladness of heart. But this is joy that comes from the heart. But it's got to be expressed in, in your confidence. Come on, you can't just say, I got joy in my heart. It looks like somebody ran over you. You know what I'm saying? That just doesn't work. And I believe that's important. Happiness is not joy, but joy needs to be expressed. Joy for just being alive. And joy for having the opportunity to touch one another in faith and encourage one another. Yeah, hold each other accountable, but in the right way. God keeps telling me it's more than about y'all. It's about me, said the Lord. And the joy that I give is your strength, but it needs to be recognized. It needs to be seen by the unbeliever. It needs to be seen by those who are downcast. Not only the unbeliever, but those who believe but are downcast for some reason or another. We all have had that moment in time where we are downcast at times. David had that. But it's only for a moment. 
because we can drink from the living waters anytime we desire. And I don't know about you guys, but my mouth has been stuck on the living waters for a while now because I need Him more and more each day. I need the power of the Holy Spirit in my life. Amen. I don't need just the Holy Spirit dwelling in me. I need for Him to come down upon me. I need for Him to help me shake up some things in my life. I need for me to be more than an example when I come into the, the walls of the church. I need to be an example at home. I need to be an example on the road. I need to be an example at work. I need to be an example in my car, in my truck. I need to be an example of something happening in me that is not by my own power, Amen. but my surrender. Right. Surrender is an awful word to those who are caught up in their selves and their pride. But I want you to know something. Unless you surrender, unless we continuously learn to surrender with joy in our heart, then pride will continue to rule you and distance you from the presence of God. And pride may not look the same on everybody, but it has the same face on it. It may not look, your pride that is constantly in your life may not look like the pride that is constantly nagging at me, but it has the same face. Once you pull off the mask, and you ought to be familiar with the mask now, right? Everybody's being pushed to wear a mask. But let me tell you something. The only time you don't know what's behind, know what's going on in a person is when they wear a mask. My wife was saying everybody that was going as she was passing, whether they were walking on the streets, not wearing a mask. Is there something wrong with wearing a mask? Not when you are mandated by the state to do it. But I wonder why the people of God wear spiritual masks all the time. God's going to peel it off. See, God knows your heart. My question is, do you know your heart? Praise the Lord. Give God the glory. Hallelujah. The name of the series is the Real Talk Series, Part 9. The Real Talk Series, Part 9. The subtitle in this series is called the restored altars of our hearts don't come cheap. The restored altars of our hearts don't come cheap. And Adam, for instance, doesn't come cheap. In this part nine, the restored altars of our hearts don't come cheap. Or it doesn't come cheap, whichever you're more familiar with or comfortable with. Now, Pastor, what do you mean by that? Well, we're going to find out. The restored altar of our hearts doesn't come cheap. Church, the altar of our hearts must be restored with a renewed devotion to our Lord God and with great expectations. Great expectations. And with a great expectancy, Brother Clav, for His soon and coming manifest presence. You know what's something, something else that restores the altar of our hearts? When we realize we're right on the brink of eternity. No matter how old or how young you are, it just takes a moment for you to walk into eternity. We need to be in that place to have a restored altar. Our hearts need to be right before God. Amen? Amen. Amen. Eternity is an awful long time. In fact, there's no time on eternity. It's outside of time. Brothers and sisters, like I said, we have to have a renewed devotion to our Lord God. And we must, in order to do that, we must have a great expectancy for His soon and coming manifest presence in this latter day revival. And it is coming. I wish I could say it be to all the professing believers, but it won't be. It'll be for those who've been crying out, those who have been bowed down in prayer. Those who have been uh, becoming, fighting uh, to be uh, before God with a pure heart, with gladness of heart, and serving Him as an example of what God can do in you, even when it's not what you want to do, it's what God's will wants you to do. I mean, you know that the, the greatest plane or the greatest battlefield, as I've said so many times before, is not the world or the pandemic, it's your own mind, it's your own thoughts. We let the littlest things get in the way of God's presence in our lives. We get upset with one another and, and get angry at one another. And then we wonder why we're so miserable. 
Oh, the devil is in my way. No, the devil is not in your way. Your heart, my heart, and the things that come out, especially behind closed doors, that's what keeps the presence of God, the manifest presence of God, revival in your heart from coming down with the power of the fire of God to come down and do something on your heart and in your heart, just like mine. Brothers and sisters, revival fire will follow revival. The thing is this, will you be in that place to receive it? Well, Pastor, I'm born again. That's not what I'm asking. I'm asking, will you be in that place to receive it? This Latter-day Revival is knocking at the church's doors, Sister Willoughby. But it will cost us. You say, what? It will cost us ourselves. Well, does the Bible say that? Yes, it does. It will cost us ourselves. Go to uh, Luke 9 for me. Let's see what the Word of God says. He said, well, Pastor, you know, I kind of like myself. Well, I'm not saying you to hate yourself. But the Lord God does say that he comes first. And I'll tell you how the Lord says it. In Luke 9, Psalm 23, the Bible says, And he said to them all, not just to a few, but to them all, those who are professing and following him, right? He said this, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. And then the next verses, they come after that, brother, watch it, or how we do that. He says this, For whosoever will save his life, that's why I say it will cost us ourselves. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. For what is a man advantaged if he gain the whole world and lose himself or be a castaway. For whosoever shall be ashamed of me and my words of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he shall come in his own glory and in his Father's and of the holy angels. Father God, I thank you for that, Lord. I thank you, Father God. But Lord God, even in costing ourselves, your word says that we will gain so much more. For ourselves, we'll gain a true life, an abundant life, Lord God. It will cost us ourselves, brothers and sisters, in our comfort and in our convenience. It will cost us our ivory couches that we all lay on, waiting for the day to arrive. It will cost us something, but I guarantee you, what it costs you, the rewards of that are far greater than anything we can possibly imagine. To he who is able to do exceedingly above anything we can possibly ask or imagine according to the power that worketh in us. It will cost us. And we'll have to get up. And it will cost us so much that it will actually draw us off our ivory couches of the waving sea mentality. Again, this evening, to all the Remnant Church family who may not be here, and to all that are here, I welcome you here and I love you so very much. And any and everything that God puts in my heart, because I do love you, I will share with you the whole counsel of God's word. But also we bid a good evening to all who may be viewing this message tonight or in the days to come. I pray that the Holy Spirit stir up in our hearts as true believers, all of us, the desire to be found in that place of faithfulness. Faithfulness. When the Lord comes down with his manifest presence of Holy Ghost fire on his people. And I pray that we are, we are hopefully in the process of repairing, Lord God, the altars of our own hearts. Back to true worship, which includes every part of our lives as believers. Spirit, soul, and body. That once more we return back to our first love and restore our lives to him as him and well. And I've said it so many times before, as living sacrifices, living sacrifices, ready for something. What is that? Ready to be consumed by his kabod, his heavy weighted presence, his heavy weighted presence in our lives, individually and then collectively as the body here on earth to set you free, to set me free, 
and to help set others free by that same power that not only set us free, but cause us to be transformed as we refuse to be conformed to this world. And everybody says, Amen. Our theme today is this. It's just a matter of time. It's just a matter of time. His manifest presence is coming down on His church. It's just a matter of time. His manifest presence is coming down on His church. Church, these last several messages have been primarily, and have all of them, in fact, one level or another, have been about revival and the manifest presence of fire of that revival coming upon us, His manifest presence. That's what it's all about. That's what I've been trying to share because I cannot get it out of my heart. That's what the church needs. That's what the church, the true body of Christ, will have. The lessons we learn from church and revival history, hear me well, are significant, Sister Jan. But I shared with us Sunday, are significant for us today. But they in themselves don't and can't take the place of preparation that comes through standing in the gap, through prayer and brokenness. Folks, as the eighth part of our message series concluded Sunday, our main focus was about the fact that it is time to repair the altar to our hearts and concerns to our God's Holy Spirit to once more shake His church awake. That's what the Bible is referring to in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 27 through 29, when He says, The voice that once shook heaven and earth again will once more shake. The things that can be shaken will be shaken out. The things that can't will remain. Why? Because a consuming fire is coming. His presence. The Bible also says in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 14 through 17. You go there for me, please. The Bible says, Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, Arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. What is the will of the Lord? Is that we be a living sacrifice. A living sacrifice. But a living sacrifice must have an altar to be a living sacrifice. And to be a living sacrifice unto the Lord, that altar must be purified. And that's your hearts, my heart. You see, this is all about in concerns to shaking the body of Christ, shaking you, shaking me. Not only shaking the things out that must go, but shake us to awaken us to the day that we have. The moment that we have, the opportunity that we have, the privilege that we have. I told Sister Nell, there are several intercessors in here. We're all called to intercede, but there's several, or a couple for sure, intercessors in here. That God has been dealing with their hearts for a while. They, they keep saying, I know something, is, I know God wants to show me something. I know, I know God's doing something, I have a burden on my heart. And I've told him before, it's a grieving it's a quick ring. Because God has shown you that the church must be prepared for His manifest presence. He is, His manifest presence is coming, but it will come when people are broken. God wants to shake us and awake us. So that the church can walk in the power of his supernatural brothers and sisters. Holy and set apart, Brother Ed, under him. The Bible says in Psalms 4 3 that we were supposed to be set apart for God. The Bible says in Psalms 4, verse 3, it says, But know that the Lord has set apart him that is godly for himself. 
the Lord will hear when I call unto him. That's why I say intercessors are being stirred right now, not only in this body, but throughout the remnant church family, throughout the world. See, the Lord God always has his remnant people. I've told you that before. The remnant church people is not just this local body. It's throughout the world. Those whom refuse to bow to the name of Baal. Those who refuse to allow the world to conform them. Those who uh, refuse to allow their own flesh to get in the way of worship him in, in spirit and truth. Yeah, we all fall short of his glory. We all are a work in progress. But my brothers and sisters, there's some things that we're not working at that we need to work at. Oh yeah, you might say, well, Pastor, I, you know, I don't like the idea of being legalistically working towards anything for God. Well, there are things you need to work towards. It's called pressing toward the high call of God, the prize, the mark of the high call of God. It will cost you and I. You say, well, I like to be blessed. God loves to bless his people. Without a doubt. But brothers and sisters, there's something more than things. There's something more than houses. There's something more than cars. There's something more than jobs. No matter what. God is our sustenance before he can be your substance. But know that the Lord has set apart him that is godly for himself. The Lord will hear. Listen, the Lord will hear when I call. Thank you, Lord. Lord God, you, you've set apart and you're going to fall upon your people, Holy Spirit, to once more shake your church awake. And have her walk in the power of your supernatural holy and set apart unto you so that when we call upon him, he will hear. How many of you know, I don't care what we say, God does not hear. And people don't like when I say this, but it's God's word. He does not hear the prayers of a sinner. He requires us to be repentant. Well, I can't be perfect, Pastor. He didn't call you to be perfect. He's the one that's perfect. But there are things that we need to deal with. The Bible makes that clear. The Bible tells us that we need to, to lay down every heavy weight and besetting sin and run our race patiently, looking towards the author and the finishing of our faith. Oh, my brothers and my sisters. We need to be empowered supernaturally by his command coming upon manifest presence of his power that comes upon a people that have been revived. Power doesn't come before revival. The heart cries out and God comes down. And the manifest presence shakes the jail cells that we're in. We may not be like Paul and Silas, but we all are easily put in our own jail cells by our own mentality. We easily limit ourselves to what we're going to do by our habits, our limitations. And God says, I want to remove the limitations. Cry out unto me. Let the joy that you say is of the Lord show itself. Let it flow in spite of what's coming against you. In spite of what's not happening at work. In spite of what's not happening at home. The joy of the Lord is the promise of God that gives you the strength to lift up your hand and say, regardless, Lord, regardless, Lord, I will be faithful to you. I will not bow to myself or to man, but I am waiting unto you, O Lord God. I will rise with the wings of an eagle, said the Lord. He said, if you exchange your faith for me, for mine, if you exchange your strength for mine, you will put on the wings of an eagle and rise and soar. There's nothing that can hold you down. He said, once more, I'm going to shake my church awake and have her walk in the power of my supernatural, holy and set apart unto me, said the Lord. Oh, hallelujah. So that you can empower your faith so that I can empower my faith, Sister Jan. So that we can empower our faith by his manifest presence in our lives. 
to bring hope to all those seeking. First of all, hope into our own lives. Many, many of God's people have given up on covenants in their lives, have given up on marriages in their lives, have given up on their children. We still pray, but but we, for some reason, we don't pray with the fervency we once did. And God wants you to pray with that fervency. You say, well, I'll never give up on my children. But have you given up on your husband, on your wife, on your relationship? And you say, oh, they'll, they'll never, they'll never, well, you know something, brothers and sisters, you. It's about you. How effective, how fervent are you in your prayer life? You got a mother that's in the rest home. You can't see like you want to. And she's wanting to, to understand. She can't understand. But your prayer life, the effective fervency of your prayer life supersedes no matter what the government says, no matter what the, the rest of them says, she will feel the presence of you even if you're not there. Your prayers are effective and fervent. If you're down on your face, get rid of all your distractions and just using you as a point of contact. God is not, not limited to walls. In fact, you walk right through the walls. His presence can be felt when your prayers are activated for that. Can anybody hear me tonight? Amen. I pray all that you would. Because you're going to need to stir up and clean up the altar of your hearts. It's to bring light and hope to all those seeking the true God of salvation. Knowing that the God Almighty is greater, greater than the darkness of the times, greater than the darkness in your life, greater than the oppression in your life, greater than the depression in your life, greater to the woman in your life, greater to, to whatever is causing you that grief in your life. He's greater than that. He's more than that. He's more powerful than any darkness. He's more powerful than any oppression. He's more powerful than anything. But you need to know that. You need to be reminded of that. You need to shake yourself and get right. You need to be more than Samson was. You need to get off of Delilah's lap. You need to stop drinking warm milk and shake yourself with assurance that God is still with you. And you need to know it and declare it. You need to be like Michael. Rejoice not against me, my enemy. When I fall, I shall arise. Enlighten, he will enlighten my darkness. But let me say something to you. If you don't allow him to enlighten your darkness, then you're going to remain in the shade instead of the sun. Amen. Amen. Oh, Father God, help us. Help us, Lord God. The darkness of times cannot be greater than the presence of God. But we have to be found faithful in doing what we know to do, Sister Flo. Starting with being a living sacrifice. Your text is in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Because no matter how you look at it, it is direct and it is real talk. His finger is on your heart. It's on my heart. Because he says it like this in Romans 12, 1 and 2. He says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God that you present your body a living sacrifice. Remember what the subtitle of this message is. The restored altars of our hearts doesn't come cheap. It doesn't come cheap. Living sacrifice is means when you're sad, you find a reason to be filled with joy. And you express it, like I said, joy that is stuck in your heart and is not revealed in your life, it's like if somebody ran over you, that's not joy. And I guarantee you, if that's what you represent before people, then why would they want what you say you have? You say, well, I can't lie. Well, I would rather be found a liar than calling my God a liar. Because I can repent for that. But God is not one. He's not the son of man. That he should repent for anything. God is not a liar. And he is the joy of my heart. And when oppression and sadness and darkness come upon me, Sister Flo, I stir something up inside of me. Says that's not who I am. God has been too good to me. I may not be grateful for all the things that have come in my life, and I'm not. But I am grateful in all things. 
as a believer. And I'm going to express that to anybody and everybody that asks why I have hope. Because you see, I'm expecting his kebab to come upon me and the body of Christ that I serve. Suddenly, surely, it will come. And people's lives, and think about this, when you get, when the kebab, when the, the manifest presence of God really comes upon your life, I dare you to stay the same. If you stay, if you stay the same, it's not his manifest presence that come upon you. I don't know what came upon you, but when God gets involved, when God comes upon you, you are changed. You say, well, I was changed when I was born again. He ain't finished changing you. He's not finished changing me. Can anybody say they amen to that? <laughs> but let me tell you something. you got to walk in that change. you got to fight against that that wants to corral you and keep you as chickens when God has set you free to be an eagle. No offense to your chicken, sis. <laughs> God removed the fences of religion. But we, for some reason, we still, even though the fences are not there, we still are stuck behind those fences. Refusing to defy darkness and know that our God is a supernatural God that if we praise Him and worship Him in spirit and truth, there's no walls, there's no fence, there's no religion, there's no pandemic, there's no darkness, there's no oppression, there's no depression, there's no sickness, there's nothing that can separate you from the love of God. But, the Bible says, with that, Paul said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. I've always said religion always wants a dead sacrifice. But God wants a living sacrifice. That's your life. It means we don't walk by our feelings. But brothers and sisters, you don't act by your feelings either. Because if you do, then you are walking by your feelings. And that's what a living sacrifice means. Because you don't let your emotions or your feelings define who you are, dictate what you're going to say. The Bible says here, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy. First of all, a living sacrifice, and then you describe what a living sacrifice is. It's just a word back there. It's holy. Holy. Meaning separated. And not only separated, it means acceptable. He says not only holy, but acceptable unto God. Which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world. But be, be you transformed by the renewing of your mind. That you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And again, I always like when I read this. I always like to read the Amplified. Because it reads in between the lines. And somebody wants to try to hide from the word of God. This just picks it all the way down to the bone. It says, I appeal unto you, therefore, brethren, and beg you, in view of all, in view of all the mercies of God, to make a decisive, listen, not decision, but a decisive dedication of your bodies. And how do we do that? Presenting all your members, Everything that concerns your body, your eyes, your mouth, especially your tongue, when all is, is tied into your heart, that's what he's talking about. Not just, well, you know, Pastor, uh, I dedicate my tithes. He ain't talking about that. He's talking about who you are. Your tithes don't make you who you are. God makes you who you are. I'm not talking about money. I'm talking about every member, your eyes, your mouth, your nose, your hands, all that. You can't say, hey, listen, I'm dedicated to the Lord, but your mouth speak trash. I said, no, 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 no. Don't work that way. I appeal to you, therefore, brethren, and beg of you in view of all the mercies of God to make a decisive dedication of your bodies, presenting all your members and faculties as a living sacrifice, holy, princess, devoted, consecrated, and well-pleasing to God. 
There are not a lot of religious people that consecrate their bodies. But it's a forced thing. It's not an internal that works itself externally. And because it's a forced thing on the outside, it becomes works. And God is not impressed with works. He's impressed with transformation. What comes starts in the heart. Because what starts in the heart and continues to flow from the heart transforms. Amen. It says it's devoted, and consecrated, and well-pleasing to God, which is your reasonable, rational, intelligent service and spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, this age, fashioned after and adapted to its external, superficial customs, and that's what I'm talking about. But be transformed, be ye transformed, changed by the entire renewal of your mind by its new ideals and new attitudes so that you may prove for yourselves what is the good and acceptable and the perfect will of God even the thing which is good and acceptable and perfect in his sight for you church bear with me in just a moment this evening, as I once more visit Elijah's time and paraphrasing it, and there's in 1 Kings 18, I won't go there verbatim, but I will refer back to it, um, especially his encounter with God as he repaired the altar. Um, when he repaired the altar, there were some things I think that most people skip over because of the, the power of what happened. But I want us to once more look underneath the rock, so to speak. I want us to look at his footprints or his footsteps and learn more about God's truth that doesn't change over time for God's people. There is an order. There is an order that God expects for his true worshipers. There is an order. It's in spirit and truth, according to John 4, 23 and 24. And it's with a clean heart, or a clean and purified heart, put it that way. Let me say that again. When we look at 1 Kings chapter 18, when we left off and primarily focused on Sunday, was when Elijah wanted to repair the altar. But I'm looking at his encounter with God at the repaired altar. And I want us to see something that happened. There was an order. And when once more, when we look at his footsteps more than just the whole thing, we look at, when I say footsteps, his individual walk, his individual steps that he took in not only repairing the altar, but what happened afterwards. Because you see, I think many people get excited when we speak about repairing the altar of our hearts. But then they stop right there because they don't know what it really means. How do you do that? Well, first of all, you must return to your first love, prior, priorities. I mean, the priorities is that you need to get anything, especially your attitude out of the way in concerns to true worship and spirit of truth. Remember what I told you in, uh, was it John 4, 23 and 24? Let's just visit that a moment while I'm uh, gathering a, a little bit of thought here. Because... The Lord God spoke that for a reason, and it trans transcends time. The Word of God says in John 4, 23 and 24, it says, But the hour cometh and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Now you notice it's in spirit and truth, uh, meaning that you cannot really worship Him if you're not born again. You can, a lot of people worship Him in truth, but they're not born again. I mean, there's a lot of good principled religious people that worship Him in a form of godliness, if you will, but they're not born again. And God wants them to worship Him in an order, spirit and in truth. Listen, it says here, For the Father seeketh such to worship Him. God is spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. I know a lot of people that know a lot, in other words, about the Word of God. They can recite the Word of God. They can pray the Word of God. But they're still living in sin. Willful sin. 
That's not acceptable to God. That's an altar that's polluted. I don't care who you are, and if you're offended, I'm sorry, but get on your face, repent, and God will bring you to that place that you need to be. And I'm talking to those who, who are not in willful sin, but have allowed, it, have allowed the altar of their heart to be no longer used for God's glory. Amen? And that goes to all of us, no matter who you are. But when Elijah went to the people, and this is something that I found quite interesting. When he told, Brother Watcher, he told the, the people, how long do you hold between two opinions? He also did something else. He told the false prophets, he said, I need for you to get your bullocks and get everything prepared for the sacrifice. And it says, and I'm paraphrasing because of time, it says that as time went on, he told them, he said, get it all prepared. He gave them one and he had one. And he let them put it on their altar, right? And they cried out unto to, to their gods, the gods of Baal, the gods of the world. And they cried out until late evening. Is that correct? Late evening. And they got no response. Is that right? And then he said, and really what he said, now it's my turn. But before he did anything, Sister Janet, it says he repaired the altar. Now wait a minute, back up a bit. Hmm. You mean to tell me there are two altars on Mount Carmel? Hmm. Is it? Yes, they did. They had two altars for the people of God. The one the people had erected and the one that God had erected. And the people of God were no longer worshiping on the altar that God's, God had erected or that God had built or that God's people had built. Because they no longer used it. Why? Because they worshiped God on the altars of the golden calf, so to speak. The false part, they had another altar that God's people started worshiping God in. And they no longer used. Well, how do you know that? Because he says he repaired the altar of God, of the Lord, before he offered. So what were they on? What altar were they offering? The one that the people had started worshiping on. Are you ever hearing what I'm saying? The people of God started worshiping at a different altar, the altar of the world, mixed with God. The God, the God of the world. Did y'all hear what I just said? Isn't that amazing, brother? How do I know that? Because the Bible says that he called all the people near him and he's repaired the altar. They were already at an altar trying to bring down God's presence, the God of this world, to do something. Say what? It wasn't God's altar. It's the world's altar. There's an order to true worship that God accepts, and it's in spirit and truth. And it's with a clean and purified altar. The Bible says, O Lord, create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. The Bible says that David also said in the verses before that, in Psalms 51, verses. Six and seven, he says, Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts. Psalms 51, verses 6 and verse 7 and verse 10. Behold, are y'all with me? Behold, thou desirest truth where? In the inward parts. And in the hidden part, thou shalt make me to know wisdom. And then he says something else. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. And in verse 10, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Folks, Elijah the prophet lived at a time, Sister Sandra, in a land when there was no fear of the Lord. No fear of the Lord anymore, Sister Eva. They have reduced God Almighty to what every man thought in his own heart God to be. It was a place not very different from our nation today and from our churches today. 
See, that's another reason, Brother Ed, that I know that the time of revival is to flow and revival fire is knocking at the door of the church harder than ever before. Harder than ever before. Oh, my dear brothers and sisters, God's got a plan. And that plan is going to come. It's going to be realized. In the New Testament, the Apostle James encourages us to be found in that place of fervent faith and a fervent prayer life, but with great expectation. That's why he wrote, when he wrote in the book of James, chapter 5, verses 16 through 18, it says that Paul wrote, or James wrote, the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, the Bible says. In James chapter 5, verses 16 through 18. It says, with a nature like ours. It means prone to ups and downs and emotions and, and saying the wrong things out of the, uh, out of the out of season and saying things he shouldn't and wishing he hadn't said them. But you know what? It says, when he came to effective and fervent prayer, he overrode his mouth with the prayer of fervency of God's word. He put his feelings where they needed to be, outside of the context of his heart, outside of the context of his altar. He made that his wood to put on the altar before he put his heart on there. The effective fervent prayer of a righteous man availed much. Elijah, as it says, was a, was a man with a nature like ours. Church, if anything is possible when we once more reestablish the altars of our hearts in devotion, anything, there's nothing too hard for God to do in our lives. When we reestablish our hearts in devotion to our God with a fresh fervency and intensity. In, in 1 Kings chapter 18, verses 17 through 39, which we used Sunday, you don't have to go there, but if you want to follow along, you, you certainly can. Because I'm going to paraphrase this next section, but it's 1 Kings chapter 18, verses 17 through 39, is what I referred to earlier about him referring, uh, repairing the altar, but the steps, his footsteps, is what I want you to look at. The Bible tells us how Elijah went on the offensive. Brother Watcher, he went on the offensive. He didn't wait for Ahab to challenge him. He challenged Ahab. He challenged the false religion. He challenged the false prophets. He challenged God's people with God and the word of God and the presence of God. He challenged them. He didn't wait. He didn't wait for them to attack first. He didn't wait for something to happen first. He went and, oh, he went on the offensive. He wanted to prove to the people of God. He wanted to even prove to Ahab It was not out of religious pride, Sister Joy, that he did that. It was not out of religious doctrine or tradition, Sister Jan, that he did that. He was not trying to show himself that he knew the word better than anyone else. But you know what he was doing? But because he was given a mandate from God. He was given a mandate from God to get God's people back on track to the one true God and the power of power of the one true God and to expect his manifest presence to prove who he is not who he was brothers and sisters as I said Sunday but before that happened before he could do that he had to repair the altar of the Lord it didn't but it didn't stop there brother Ed it didn't stop with the repair of the altar you three back there, it didn't stop with the repaired altar, Sister Word, Sister Trumpet, Sister uh, Rhonda, Sister Warrior. It didn't stop with the repairing of the altar. Because the repairing of the altar goes further than wanting to repair the altar. There's things that you have to do, things that I have to do, and things that must be done for the presence of God to come upon your life. And I'm not just speaking to those three back there, I'm speaking to all of us. And all, all of those who are listening to this message. Started with me first. It didn't stop with the repair at altar. Because after that, something had to be placed on that altar. 
before the sacrifice. Give him my shepherd what it was. It was the wood, right? Oh, what is wood? Well, Pastor, I'm sure, please. No, listen to me. Something had to be placed on that altar before. Just like today, something has to be placed on your repair altar before you can put your heart on there to be consumed by His presence. What is that? You got to get your heart right. Personally. What do you have to place on the altar before our God? Do you have some wood of your own? Spiritually speaking? Before you lay your heart there to be consumed by God's presence, things are meant to be burned away before God. God's not going to burn away your heart, but He wants to burn away something else in your heart to purify your heart. But it's not going to happen if you don't lay it on the, on the altar. So you put it on the altar before you put your heart on the altar. You, your heart, is the living sacrifice. Your life. That's right back there. He's agreeing with me back there. I hear it. Hallelujah. Out of the mouth of babes. Lit, I hear you too, Lydia. What do you have to place on the altar before God? Do you have wood, some wood of your own before you lay your heart there to be consumed by God's presence? Things that are meant to be burned away before God that up to now you haven't put up there and left up there. Maybe it's pride. That's wood. Maybe it's unforgiveness. Or murmuring and complaining against one another. Or others in your lives. Or lack of gratitude. How about self-centeredness? How about procrastination? That's, that needs to be put on that altar, right? How about complacency, compromise, and down and double-mindedness? Or some other besetting sin or heavy weight in your life, your habit that weighs you down or encumbers you from winning your race as you should over and over and over again. Let me tell you something. God's manifest presence is knocking. The intercessors are praying. With fervency and effectiveness, they got their head between their legs so that they're not torn or distracted from the north or to the side, or either right side or left side, between things that bother them or between, you know, little trivialities that, that are of no value to anyone except themselves. No, you got something, you when you're headed between your legs, it's because you're effectively and fervently praying. Well, let me ask you something. What did Elijah do once he called down the fire, and the fire of the manifest presence came down and licked up the altar, took all the wood, licked up all the water? What did he do? He went to that mountaintop. He went to that place, and he put his head in between his legs, and he started praying. Because that's when... When all the stuff, all the hay, wood, and stubble had been removed, that the altar of God not only was repaired, but was restored. The altar, the heart of God's people was restored. And the, God would bring back, bring down an abundance of His anointing, His revival waters to refresh, restore, and bring about all manifestation of fruits unto the Holy Ghost, unto the power of God, unto the kingdom of God. Oh, hallelujah. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, the Bible says, Wherefore, seeing we are also accomplished about with so great a cloud of witnesses, Hebrews 12, 1, let us lay aside every heavy weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Church, today, when we see Jesus, the Jesus of our faith and our faith and all that concerns our covenant promises with God through the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ come under attack. And we feel out numbers. You've got to remember something that again, Elijah in his footsteps felt the same way. He complained to God. He said, I'm, I and I alone am the only one who has not bowed down and kissed the feet of Baal. And God says, don't be silly. He didn't say it quite like that. He said, says, I've got 7,000 hid away in the cage. In other words, there were men and women of God on their faces praying effectively and fervently for that moment. For that moment, 
that Elijah called down the presence of God. For Elijah to repair the altar of God. For Elijah to go on the offensive and charge Ahab and the people of God. God gave Elijah a mandate to get God's people right. And that is the mandate that I'm preaching from today. That our altars be purified. Our hearts be purified. Put your wood on the altar before you put your heart up there. Your heart is a living sacrifice. Altar is your life. But in between that, you've got to put the wood up there. That hay, wood, and stubble. That stuff you and I have accumulated and we allow to accumulate in the corners of our life thinking that it doesn't affect. I want you to know that God knows your heart. God knows my heart. The question is, do you know your heart? Have you looked at yourself in the mirror lately? Because the mirror image that you see cannot lie. So neither can God's word. Amen. Brothers and sisters, if we are to do and be God's remnant people throughout the world. We're ready, we must be ready to follow him at every level that he calls us to. I just pray that we be included among them. I pray that the, the remnant people that God is pulling up right now, that this church be part of them. That you, 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 me, be part of the people that are ready to purify the altars of their hearts. Are ready to worship the Lord in spirit and truth and deal with all the little things that we've allowed to cause us to worship at another altar and not even realize it. Just like the people of God. Do you think the people of God on Mount Carmel thought that they were worshiping Baal? No, they were following false prophets. They took a man of God who was unknown, a Kislev, to come upon the scene and challenge the king and come to a place where all of them came together, prophet and people to worship God and address them right where they were. And that's what I'm doing today. I'm addressing everybody that's here in this session right where you are today. At what altar are you worshiping? Them? Because unless you put the wood on the altar, you can't put your heart on there because you see, your heart will be consumed by God. He is a consuming fire. He will consume the hay, wood, and stubble, he'll consume your pride, he'll consume your back mouth, and he'll consume your, your uh, loose lipping, your, your grudges, your unforgiveness. All, he'll consume that, but you've got to put it on the altar. That's what's going to clean your heart. That's what's going to purify your heart. Are you all hearing me? And if that is the case, Brother Ed, we are going to have to see the altar of the Lord repaired in our generation. Starting with our own hearts. And I find it amazing. As I said earlier. That Israel had two shrines. Like today. One with golden calves. Where the people worshipped on Mount Carmel. And the false prophets were. But Elijah. As I said earlier. If you follow his footsteps. In 1 Kings chapter 18. You'll see where he dealt with that. In the evening. After they had finished. Trying to evoke their gods. He called people of God unto him. Because there was another altar. Listen. One that was used to worship God in purity, that they had, that apparently had been allowed to no longer be used in their lives. They no longer approached that place as a place of devotion because of what that altar required. You know what that altar required? Purity. A pure heart. That's why they didn't go there anymore. This was the place where prophets and people could go and commune with him. However, at some point, somewhere, that altar fell in disuse, like many people of God today. We forget and we think that real talk, when God puts his finger on our hearts, that um, it's not for me. I'm okay. But I'm telling you, God is speaking to us all. Are you preserving your relationship with God? So that the most important thing to you to accept to the extent that no matter what happens, you will remain surrendered to Him. Because see, that's what it reminds us. Living sacrifice is to remain surrendered. Not when it's convenient or comfortable, but especially when you don't feel like it. 
And you know the thing about it is, you may remain surrendered to God, but you also, in doing that, you remain with a gladness of heart in serving God and surrendering to God and serving one another. See, this is what the Apostle Paul was talking about, Sister Lillardine, when he said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. That's our text. Holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. See, the altar of the Lord is that place of consecration. Sister Victoria is that place of consecration. Revealed, listen to me, not in church services on Sunday or Wednesday, but on Monday morning behind closed doors. And when you go out into the rough and tumble of the real world, where no Christian eyes are continually on you. Folks, as we repair the altar of the Lord in our hearts, the fire of God is going to hit our lives in a visible way. Don't you understand that? Suddenly and assuredly without any warning. The warning that he's giving is giving, being given now. But brothers and sisters, all of us must choose in a real way now how we will serve the Lord God. Because, you see, it will be evidenced by that man in the mirror that we look at every day. See, that's what Jeremiah 17, 9, 10 speaks to me about. You know, we look at so many things, but we don't see it in context until you hear a message like this that the Lord gave you. The Word of God says in Jeremiah 17, 9 and 10, it says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And then it's like if the Lord answers that, says the Word, it says, I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the rain even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doing. That's why I tell you, that's why I tell you that your heart will be evidenced by the man in the mirror that you look at every morning. Church, God already knows our hearts. But the question is, do you know yours as he does? If we believe that Jesus is Lord, then we should serve him wholeheartedly. And that means, and I, I can't say it enough, with the right attitude. If your attitude is right, your service is wrong. Period. I can prove that to you. If you want to look at the prodigal son, the, the, the prodigal son, his elder brother, served God, served his father, but with the wrong attitude. So his service is wrong. He didn't even enjoy the, the fruit of his labor. He didn't even enjoy the blessings of his inheritance because he made it so legal, so hard on himself. His attitude was lousy. If we believe that Jesus is Lord, then we should serve him wholeheartedly with gladness of heart. But if anyone has other values that are more important and stronger and require their devotion over and above Jesus, then you should just say so. But let me tell you, keeping a foot in both camps is not acceptable. Keeping a foot in both, at both altars is not acceptable. Well, Pastor, why do you say that? Because that's exactly what Elijah said to the people of God. How long will you halt between two opinions? To, what he was saying is I got two altars for you to worship at. What he was saying in essence is you got the altar here that the false prophets have built and that's where you commune at. But then you have the altar that you turn your back on which is purity and consecration and devotion to the one true living God. Because you no longer used it, you fell prey to the one that everybody else is using. He said, how long will you halt between these two opinions? Where are you going to worship at? Where is your devotion going to be at? Here there's no consecration. Here there's devotion, purity and consecration. But it's here, this altar, the one that is repaired before the Lord, the one that demands consecration and purity, that the presence of God manifests himself on and destroys the wood, destroys the sacrifice, destroys all that was placed on that altar. But his presence was so powerful that it caused Elijah to go forth on that mountaintop and get down and pray effectively and fervently for the rain 
to come upon the land to bless God's people. Because you see, rain was about blessing God's people. Rain was about abundance. Rain is in, in line with revival. God's revival is about blessing His people, causing them to rise up into that position of faithfulness to their God so that He can empower their faith to do the miraculous. Signs and wonders shall follow after them. Miracles shall abound within them. The Word of God says this is the confirmation of His command, His heavy-weighted presence. But it comes down upon the church. There's no limit. There's no wall. There's nothing that can keep God's people from declaring His glory. Yes. That's what Elijah did when you follow his steps. Elijah told God's people in his day, and if you read in the book of Joshua, Sister Joy, that's exactly what Joshua told God's people also in Joshua 24, verses 14 and 15. He says, Me and my house, we shall worship the Lord. Let's read the full context of that and see if it doesn't sound really, really familiar, maybe from a different uh, voice. But it's the same spirit that came from Elijah when he ultimately gave that same ultimatum to not the world, Sister Nell, back there, but to God's people. Look what he said in Joshua 24. I almost started verse 13. He says, And I have given you a land for which you did not labor, and cities which you built not, and you dwell in them, are the vineyards and out of yours which you planted not, planted not, do you eat? And then he says this, look how he, he challenges God's people again. He says, now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in what? Truth. And then what? Just leave it like that? No, apparently they had false gods in their homes, false gods in their lives, right? Pretty much kind of like the people of Mount Carmel, right? They had a false altar up there, right? See, God doesn't want two altars, one for you and one for him. There's one altar for him. The Bible says, Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth, and put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt, and serve you the Lord. And then he goes on to say this, And if it seem evil unto you, to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve. Isn't that what Elijah asked the people of God? How long will you hold between two, two uh, opinions? Either Baal, and if Baal be your God, serve him. But if not, serve God. Whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites, in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We will serve the Lord. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Brothers and sisters, so how can we repair the altar of the Lord in our life? By restoring pure devotion. That non-religious longing for God. Even when our right doings become absence of devotion and consecration, then they become useless. They become rituals. They become empty trinkets and, and symbols that have no sound. Folks, this is not just about doing what you feel like doing. There's got to be a kind of discipline so there is some structure in your life to press forward to the prize of God in Christ Jesus. That's what Paul was talking about in Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 through 14. Brothers and sisters, it's not about stirring up your emotions. It's not about you stirring up your emotions. To produce your own energy. It's not about trying to attempt something in your own strength. That only God can enable you to do. Philippians chapter 3 verses 12 through 14. Sister. You see when you try to do something in your own strength. That only God can enable you to do. This is when strange fire comes into your life. And God won't accept that. God won't accept strange fire. And neither will he be found in strange form. Church, we have to flow with the grace of God. 
and let our lives be taken over by the Holy Spirit. Because it is only the Holy Spirit that can move us in the direction that God wants us to be, to that altar of dedication, renewal, and restoration, to that altar of revival, to that altar of the manifest presence of God's holy kabod coming upon us. When Elijah prepared the sacrifice, he wanted everybody to know that what was about to happen was from God. So he asked to drench the altar with water several times until it was absolutely dripping wet. And then Elijah did something. He didn't keep on stirring up the people. He stepped back. Read it for yourself in 1 Kings 18. He stepped back. Elijah stepped back and cried out to the Lord. Asking him to reveal himself. You hear what I'm saying? He said, reveal yourself, O oh God. He asked him to reveal himself by fire. And God didn't reveal himself by water. He revealed himself by what Elijah asked him to reveal himself by. Fire. Fire fell. So fire fell, Sister Eva, and licked up all the water. Burned up the sacrifice, and everyone fell on their faces and shouted, the Lord, He is God. Now I know that we know the Lord is God. I know that we, we love the Lord Jesus Christ. But brothers and sisters, I also know that our altars, our hearts, our lives have been the altar of our lives. Our hearts have been neglected when it comes to devotion, when it comes to consecration. We all have. We've kind of hodgepodge it a bit. And God says, my kabod, my heavy weighted presence is coming down for people that's crying out for me for revival. And when I, my presence comes down, they will be changed like they've never known before. You will be consumed by the fire so that you will be far. My far, my holy far, set apart unto me. Elijah stepped back and cried unto the Lord, asking him to reveal himself in answering by fire. So far fell, licked up the water, burned up the sacrifice. And everybody said, the Lord is God. As the far fell, and everyone present declared that the Lord is the one and the true living God. It was then and only then that Elijah went with fervency and power to pray for a supernatural blessing for all the sea. The rains came. The rains came. Meaning that God was now ready to bless his people. As the hearts of his people had been restored and restored to the hill. A question or word that God wants me to leave you with today is this. God is waiting for us. Waiting for each and every one of you, starting with me, to come clean before him. To get your hearts right before him. Because you see, he's given you the mercy and grace to do that. But we lean far, far too over to the other altar that includes self and God. And he said, I want you to re repair, restore, and renew the altar that is unto me, said the Lord. And I will visit your life with my manifest presence. May the Lord strengthen us in the days to come and cause us to be perfect in a perfect peace as we stay our mind upon him. Do I have an amen tonight? Amen. Just give God all the glory. As we close tonight, I ask that the Lord dispatch his mighty traveling angels to assist you going home. To cause you to recollect and remember all that the Holy Spirit has spoken to you and to I tonight. And to really get serious about revival and about His manifest presence coming upon your life. Get your altars in order. Get your wood placed on that altar. Your stubbornness, your pride, your double-mindedness, the words that will allow them speak against other brothers and sisters or are griping and murmuring and complaining. That's wood. That's, that's stuff that God detests. You need to put it on the altar. You need to consecrate your hearts, your life once more. 
and let his cabal, his manifest presence, consume and change you. Lift your hands. Please visit us, Lord. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Father God, stir up your people. Stir up your people, Father God, with a hunger and thirst that cannot be satisfied. Cannot be satisfied with your yesterday. Cannot be satisfied, Father God, with a lack of joy. With a lack of hope. Cannot be satisfied with just rituals and traditions that they have made the holy things of God. Rituals and traditions, but have forgotten the privilege that goes along with it. Joy! Joy, joy, joy. And great expectations. Look to the heavens. Be assured, be assuredly, and know that God will come upon the body of Christ suddenly, unaware, not that you haven't been warned, but unaware. And the moment that you think that it won't happen, it will happen. And the people of God will know that not only is God in the midst of them, but His Holy Spirit has come upon them. In the name of Jesus, we all say, Amen. Amen. Give God the glory. Hallelujah.